So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, call up uh, Sheikh Naveed Aziz, uh, who will talk to us about sunshine in Medina. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'd. My dear brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came into Medina and when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, one of the great companions, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he described this scenario with the radiance of the sun. He said, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came into Medina, there was no day that was brighter and no day happier than the day that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, there was no day that was more sad and darker than the day that he passed away. Now when you look at the way this young child, Anas ibn Malik, who is perhaps, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is passing away, and the impact that the Prophet ﷺ had in his life, it makes you wonder, what did the Prophet ﷺ do that even the young children were able to describe the Prophet ﷺ in such a manner? My dear brothers and sisters, the topic of my discussion today is Medinan society and what are lessons that we can extract from it to implement today. And I wanted to focus on three issues in particular to construct our group thinking in terms of how we can implement Medinan society in our day and age today. Before the Prophet ﷺ came into Medina, some of the companions had already migrated. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he arrives, he starts pairing them up. He starts, preparing, he starts pairing up some of the Muhajirun with some of the Ansar. One of the famous examples that is mentioned inside Sahih al-Bukhari is when the Prophet ﷺ paired up Abdurrahman ibn Auf with Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah radiallahu anhuma. Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he's just made hijrah from Mecca, from a wealthy family, from everything that he owned, and he comes into Medina not owning anything now. So the Prophet ﷺ pairs him up with Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah. And I want you to look what Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah says to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. He tells Abdurrahman ibn Auf, I have two businesses, take one of these businesses. I have two houses, take one of these houses. And this is before the, the time that marital law had been established. He said, I have two wives, choose any one of my two wives and you can even have one of them. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf, you can imagine how overwhelming this scenario is. Someone's showing so much generosity to go out of their way. Yet he ends up telling them, look, just show me where the marketplace is so that I can start earning for myself. And within the story itself are so many lessons that can be learned as to how Medina society was established. The first thing you come to see is the importance of generosity and the importance of sacrifice. And that is what Sa'd ibn Rabi'ah radiallahu anhu was willing to do. He was willing to sacrifice half of what he had for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a man that he knows nothing about other than the fact that he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa so the first thing we need to understand that if we truly want to establish a Medinan society today, it's not going to come easy. It's going to come with sacrifice. A lot of things will have to be sacrificed. But look at the end result. The end result is you have a child describing the leader of your community with, it was the saddest day I have known in my life, the day that the leader passed away. That was the end result of it. And this shows us that as a community moving forward, challenges will be faced, sacrifices will have to be made, but the ultimate focus should be, where is this all leading to, along with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A second thing you notice in this story from Abdurrahman ibn Auf is that he says, look, I'm not interested in your handout. I appreciate your generosity, but I'm not interested in the handout. Show me where the marketplace is, becoming independent. And this is something I cannot emphasize enough. Independency of the Muslim community, but independency while putting our trust in Allah, while having taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islamically speaking, there's nothing wrong with Abdurrahman ibn Auf taking this handout. But he knows for himself that the individual that strives for himself and he works hard, wakes up early in the morning and tries to earn his sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely bless him. 
How does this story conclude? That not only a few days go by, yet Abdurrahman is walking past the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam with a yellow stain on his garment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he asks him, Ya Abdurrahman, what is this stain? And he says, Ya Rasulullah, I got married. And we know they were celebrating the marriage and he got a stain on his clothes. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he tells him, you know, awlim walaw bishah, that have a walima even if it's just with, with an animal. And he asked him, you know, what did you give us the mahar? And he said, I gave us a mahar, a, a, a gold nugget. So a man that came into Medina a few days ago in extreme poverty, he's doing business, all of a sudden he can afford to get married now. And on top of that, he's affording to give her a mahar. He's proud that he's able to fulfill this right of his wife upon him. And this shows us the end result of working hard and putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the first thing, that we need to understand that Medina society will not be established without individual sacrifice. If we think it's going to come easy, it's not going to happen. Medina had to make a lot of sacrifices before it became the home of a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A second thing we need to understand is that a community is only as strong as its individuals. A community is only as strong as its individuals. When the Muslim community was in Medina, there were still some internal threats that were in it, right? We had some of the alliances that were made with the other tribes. They were betrayed, and then they had to kick those tribes out. And it was at that time that when those tribes were kicked out, the internal problems were taken care of. And likewise, they had signed the Treaty of Hudaybiyah with the Quraysh, where the external problems are taken care of. It is only eight to nine years after the Messenger of Allah وسلم, coming that the Muslims are finally facing some sort of peace. So internally, their conflicts had to be resolved, and externally, they had to be resolved as well. But what was a key crux in this message? The taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He describes the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, He calls it, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. We've indeed given you clear and manifest victory. Yet when you look at the terms of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, as you saw from the expressions of Amr ibn al-Khattab and some of the other companions, it seemed like it was a manifest defeat. How is it a victory that the, um, the, the Muslims weren't allowed to get their captives back? They weren't allowed to go for Umrah. Anything that the Quraysh had of theirs had to be returned to them. It wouldn't be reciprocated. How is this a victory? It was a victory because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a greater plan for the Muslims at that time. That it was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that led to the Fath of Mecca. That if the, if the Huday, Treaty of Hudaybiyah wasn't there, the Fath of Mecca couldn't have happened. So after you've taken those steps of resolving internal conflicts and building a community and ex eliminating external you know, trials, that's when you can actually start building. But how long did that take? It took eight to nine years of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, being there, showing us that it needs to take time. Now this element of building a community, there are many you know, elements that I, I want to focus on over here. Number one is leadership. Leadership in the community is of the utmost significance and importance. If you have a million followers but no leaders, the community is not going to go anywhere. Yet if you were to have just 10 dedicated people and to have a good leader, then moving forward that small community of 10 people can do a lot. And that is what you see in the likes of the Muslim community in the early days, that while they were few in number, their leadership was authentic and they knew where it was going. And I don't mean to criticize anyone here today or criticize any leadership that we have. But as a general rule of thumb worldwide, not just within the Muslim community, those that are meant to be our leaders are shying away. And those that are supposed to be the furthest away from our leadership, they're actually becoming our leaders. This is the reality of the situation. Now what are you looking for in terms of leaders? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Sajda, he describes the people of the past when he says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَحْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُقِنُونَ That we made from those people before us, leaders, when they did what? صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُقِنُونَ That they had a great amount of patience and they were certain of our verses and certain of our signs. يَحْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا That they used to guide by our command. So these are three characteristics that they gave them. So number one, يَحْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا Meaning guiding by our command, the knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to be there. Having leadership where that knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not there, you're never going to have successful leadership. Because leadership without what will make you successful in this life and the next 
is going to be haphazard. It'll either make you successful in this life, but not successful in the next, or in most cases, it won't make you successful in either. So the success of true leadership starts off with knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then number two, lamma sabaru, that in moments of trials and tribulations, they were patient. Meaning that their akhlaq was of the utmost importance that they manifested and represented the greatest characteristics of Islam. So any good characteristic that you can think of, it was found in their leaders. And this is why the Imam is called an Imam. Not because he leads the Salah, not because he's in the front, but because he becomes an example for the people. وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama. It is understood as make us an example for the muttaqin, so that they follow us. And that is what true leadership is. Not telling the people what to do, but being an example of what they should follow. And that was the second element of it. And they used to have yaqeen in our signs and yaqeen in our verses. So this can be understood in two ways. Meaning verses of the Quran, that they should have yaqeen in this and all the, 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 the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about. Or yaqeen in the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the ayat al kawniya the, the signs of the universe that are there, that they're certain of this. Meaning that everything has a set system, and this set system will come into place sooner or later. That you need to be patient, you need to, you know, just let the, the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unfold. Every single day the sun sets and the sun rises, not a single day in our history has mankind, has that not happened. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those are that are oppressed one day will be victorious one day. And those are that are victorious will one day become oppressed. This is the repetitive cycle of the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a glad tiding for the ummah in actuality that while we may be in a state of oppression right now in most areas, the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those that are oppressed end up becoming strong. Look at what happened with Bani Israel. They were weak and being oppressed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them Musa. And Musa alayhi salam, through the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ends, ends up bringing them victory. And look at what ends up happening, right? So this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's in terms of leadership. Now one thing I want to emphasize on is that particularly in the Muslim community, those that are meant to be our leaders often shy away. They'll often end up saying, you know what, I'm not the right person. And this can be understood as modesty. Or they may say, you know, I'm not fit. Following the example of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Saying that, you know what, Abu Bakr shied away. Why shouldn't I shy away? You know, we should, as Muslims, we shouldn't be struggling and striving for power. This is generally true. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us that as a Muslim, we should not be craving power. We should not be craving attention. We should not be craving authority. But at the end of the day, if those that are worthy of being in authority don't end up taking authority, look what ends up happening to the people at that time. They end up having terrible leaders and the situation ends up becoming even worse. You know, there's a, a very good book that uh, I'm going to, to mention at the end. Actually, I'll, I'll just mention it right now. It's called Medinan Society at the Time of the Prophet. Medinan Society at the Time of the Prophet. This was written by one of the great professors at the Islamic University of Medina many, many years ago, uh, Sheikh Akram Diya al Amari. Uh, and he alludes to something very profound over here. He says, when you look at leadership within the Muslim community, either the Muslim community strives forward towards a purpose, and they become united towards a purpose, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forces them to unite through calamity. I want you to think about that. Either we as Muslims strive forward and get united towards a common purpose and goal, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forces us to become united through a calamity. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a choice. You can either become united throughout your own free will and unite towards a common goal and purpose, or I will force you to become united by stranding you through a, a severe calamity. Now I want you to look at the nature of calamity. You know, there's a, a famous story that's mentioned in Arabic literature. It's the story of three bulls. The story of three bulls. A red bull, not the drink, you know, just a red colored bull. A black bull and a white bull. And these three bulls, they're always together. They're part of the same community. They look after one another. And every time a lion comes to try to attack them, he does not succeed because they're united together. Now one day the lion gets clever. And he comes up to the black bull and the red bull. 
and he says, look, I promise to leave you two alone. Just let me get the white bull. The red bull and the black bull, they talk it over and they say, you know what? As long as he leaves us alone, let us sacrifice the white bull. And the white bull ends up getting eaten. Now what ends up happening to the lion? Some time goes by, he gets hungry again. This time he comes up to the red bull and he says, look, I promise to leave you alone as long as you let me eat the black bull. The red bull thinks about it. He says, look, as long as he promises to leave me alone, let him have the black bull. And he sacrifices the black bull as well. What's going to happen? Some time is going to go by again where the lion gets hungry. And this time he comes up to the red bull. And the red bull is petrified. It has fear in its eyes. But one thing keeps repeating itself in its mind. Inni ukiltu yawma ukila thorul abyad. That indeed I was eaten the day the white bull was eaten. Meaning that the day that I sacrificed my brother was the day that I was destroyed as well. I just didn't realize it at that time. And that is the nature of, of, of calamity, subhanAllah. That either it will force people to unite and come together and stay strong like they were in the beginning, or they end up turning upon each other and the community and society ends up being destroyed. And this is such a very valuable lesson for Muslims in this day and age. Now I want to move on quickly to the second point after we've talked about leadership. The second point was financial independence and freedom. And that's what we saw from Abdurrahman ibn Auf. He says, look, I don't want your handouts. Just teach me, where, sorry, just show me where the marketplace is and I, I want to just go and do business. When you look at how financially dependent Muslims are in Muslim minority communities, it's quite unsettling. We don't own our own businesses. There are very few Islamic financial institutions. If we need a loan, we're still forced to deal with riba a lot of the times. And I know you're going to tell me that now a lot of housing corporations are popping up. A lot of Islamic credit unions are popping up. And with all due respect, these are fantastic. We need more of these. But at the end of the day, if you were to compare them to conventional credit unions, you're still being charged an arm and a leg extra compared to how you taken the mortgage. Now Islamic finance is not supposed to be at par with conventional finance. It's supposed to be even better. Yet in this situation, wanting to pursue halal is being made so much more difficult than, wanting to, than, being, than having the ability to pursue the haram. And that is why I say there's so much room still to grow and still to learn. One of the things we learn from early Medinan society is the concept of a waqf. Having awqaf in a community. And I talked about this extensively two years ago at my lecture over here. On how Muslims have a responsibility in the West of building a waqf. Where all of our financial expenses should come out of this waqf. We do a fantastic job of building masajid. We do a fantastic job of building uh, elementary schools and high schools. And yes, these are needed. But at the end of the day, we need to think long term. In terms of longevity, we need to be here in Canada. We need to be here in North America. And financial independence will be needed. So why is it we have not established this long-term work where people donate their money and that money is invested. And as that money grows, the needs of the community are met. Likewise, when we think about business models for our masajid, it should no longer just be a space of prayer but rather it should be a prayer space that below it or around it are systems in place to support the masjid. We all know the most devastating moment of Ramadan is the 27th night. We're thinking it's Laylatul Qadr, we want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You end up praying eight rakahs, you're getting ready to stand up for the 10th rakah, and what ends up happening? Brothers and sisters, we're having a fundraiser for $500,000. And if you do not give us the money, we will not let you pray. That's the reality, right? Now imagine if we end up setting up a waqf where the masjid is supported by apartment buildings around the masjid or businesses surrounding the masjid that are owned by the masjid. You would no longer be in that situation. As Muslims, we should not be in the habit of asking. We should be in the habit of giving. So if our masajid and our administrations and our leadership learn to do this, we would no longer be asking for handouts. And I agree, we're still in our infancy stage in the West. But we need to start thinking towards this, where we are establishing awqaf for our masajid, for our Muslim organizations, so we're no longer dependent upon asking people for donations. 
Because the time eventually comes in where people don't want to donate. They want to see results for their donations, right? And one of the ways that is done is um, donating towards a waqf where that money is invested and then given back to the community projects. And then the Muslim can then, then focus on building greater and better things. I'm telling you, we're so stuck on building masajid and building elementary schools. Who is going to build our Muslim university? Who is going to build our first Muslim hospital? Who is going to build our you know, first X, Y, and Z project? That is a need for the community. We can't just keep repeating what we've done already. We need to move forward. But in order to do that, that key element of financial independence needs to be there. Now I told them I'd, I'd try my best to finish by six. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me the tawfiq to do so. So I've covered two points, the leadership and the finances. Now let me move into the last point, which is the importance of education. As Muslims, we've always been pioneers in knowledge. Knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowledge that we call secular. But I want to tell you guys something and make it clear from right here and right now. This dichotomy of religious knowledge versus secular knowledge, from, Islamic, from an Islamic history perspective, it doesn't exist. This concept of religious knowledge versus non-religious knowledge, it didn't exist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He refers to knowledge in general in the Qur'an. It was never followed by al-ilm al-shar'i, by religious knowledge, right? That, that disclaimer didn't need to exist because all forms of knowledge are praiseworthy in Islam. Because if you look at all knowledge, in its true essence, where does it all lead back to? It always leads back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa fawqa kulli dhi ilmin alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most knowledgeable of every knowledgeable person here. Meaning that the source of all knowledge is al alim, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why when you study math in detail, you study biology in detail, you study anatomy in detail, you study any science in detail, it always leads us back to the miraculous and grandiose nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has created such a perfect system that is found in this science. Now, I know that Sheikh Dawood, he spoke about you know, physical education yesterday. I know he's done a lot of work talking about the education system, particularly in Ontario, and the crisis that is going through right now. But what do we end up learning from this crisis? We end up learning one of the biggest lessons, and I hope we've realized this already, is that we're very reactive. A crisis happens and we react to it. Very seldom are we proactive in that situation. Now I want you to think about, as Muslims in the Western world, the crisis that Western Muslim students go through. Not only is there that major identity crisis of trying to balance Eastern culture with Western culture, that balance of you know, being a practicing Muslim and praying five times a day when the schools that we go to are not conducive to praying five times a day. As a university student, winter time comes, you need to pray your five daily prayers and you have Dhuhr, Asr and Maghrib that were in the span of four hours. Yet you have classes at that time, what are you meant to do? And it puts the students in a difficult situation. Make things even more worse. When it comes time to go to school, how do we get the finances to go and get that education? Most of the times they have to end up taking student loans which are based upon interest. I'm not going to get into the fiqh of that right now, but I'm just presenting the problems here. Meaning that the Western education system is not a hundred percent, not even close to hundred percent conducive to the Muslim lifestyle. So what this should be teaching us is rather than us reacting to curriculums in high school and universities and why are they teaching Darwin's theory and so on and so forth, when will the time come when we start taking education in our own hands and presenting it to our children? Like I said, we've done a great job, alhamdulillah, with elementary schools and alhamdulillah, some high schools as well. But that next phase is there. When you look at what the Prophet ﷺ did when he came to Medina, his first steps, pairing up the people to make that brotherhood, building up a masjid so that the people can unite and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time have a place to learn. The masjid was the center of learning and it continued to be like that for many, many hundreds of years. Now I'm not saying our education system needs to go back to the masjid. The sharia doesn't require that. But what it does require of us is that we take ownership of our own education. An education curriculum that is based upon Quranic theory, is based upon the themes that are found in the Quran, and then all other sciences are taught with that, uh, under that lens or through that lens that tie you back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than separate you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
My dear brothers and sisters, these are just some of the brief thoughts I had in terms of lessons we can derive from Medina society. And as I mentioned in, in, in the middle of my lecture, there is a fantastic book called Medinan Society at the Time of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is a study of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, particularly post-Hijrah, and what are the lessons that we can derive from it. It's published by a group called I, uh, Triple IT, if I'm not mistaken. And you can purchase it online, you can even download it online, inshallah. Read this book, and there's some magnificent lessons for those of us that are actually interested in trying to build a Medinan society in our times. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the tawfiq to do so, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to serve this deen, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us for our sins and shortcomings. Jazakum Allah khairan for your attention. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.